Okay, what we've been talking about is uh, credit markets and how those credit markets function, how an interest rate is determined. Uh, we have this model, and today we'd like to finish that up, but the model that's got two components of demand, there was the demand for credit by the business sector, a demand for credit by the government for the deficit, we add those two demands together to get the total demand for credit. Okay, we had three sources of credit supply. You remember what those were? The first source of credit, credit supply, saving by households. And I'll put the S up here, it could stand for saving, but supply. There's a credit supply which is related to growth of the money supply, I'm using the delta sign here for change, but it's when the money supply changes in that process of uh, Federal Reserve policy that we get credit being supplied. And then here's this foreign supply of credit. We add those three sources of supply together, we get a total supply, and then total supply, total demand determine an equilibrium interest rate, and then after we've got an equilibrium interest rate, we can put this dotted line across here and see how each sector responds to that market interest rate. Okay. So anyway, this is our model. Uh, last time we talked about various things. What if we've got a change in the government's deficit? What if we have a change in the saving rate of Americans? Uh, what if we have a change in the foreign supply of credit? And I think what, in each instance I use some event that would cause that to happen. Uh, maybe more government spending in one case. Uh, another case there was a greater supply of credit from households because of a longer lifespan or let's say less generous uh, government benefits for people that, you know, I call it the social safety net, but people who are, uh, lose their jobs and so forth, poor people. Um, the foreign supply uh, of credit can change because I just gave the example, suppose that there's prosperity overseas, uh, that in foreign countries they're experiencing a lot of economic growth, then that economic growth, they can buy more, but they also save more. And when they save more, some of those savings may make their way to the United States. What we want to talk about today is the first thing, what if we have a new monetary policy? What if monetary policy becomes more expansionary? Well, if monetary policy becomes more expansionary, then there's a new money supply curve, money supply, credit supply curve. I'll shift that over here to the right. I'll put a little one right here and circle that. Here's our first step in our analysis. Second step in our analysis is now that there is this new supply of credit coming to the market because of monetary policy, the total supply of credit is larger than before and then the interest rate is lower than before. And that's the end of the what happens when we get this credit supply, uh, uh, this expansionary monetary policy, that's the end of the process where we figure out how did that impact interest rates. But then there's another part of the analysis. How do those interest rates affect the economy? Okay, and so here's one thing that happens. Interest rates go down and so now businesses are induced to borrow more money to finance capital investments. There'll be more factories built, there'll be more machines and equipment and so forth purchased by businesses to invest in that business. There'll be restaurants that are expanded, there'll be shopping malls that are increased in size, remodeling, renovation. How about over here? Interest rates down, what do households do? Households respond by saving less. Okay, now I'm going to put this up here, which you've seen before. Here's disposable income. And we've got two things we can do with it, consumption spending and saving. Well, what we just said is this. Interest rates went down, so people save less. 
guess what? If you've got $100 in income, and you were spending, let's say you're spending 95 and saving five, if you now save only three, you're saving less, then you spend more. What that interest rate does is it doesn't change your income, it changes how you use that income. Do you spend it now or do you spend it later? And when that interest rate goes, goes down, it says, you know, spend more now, spend less of it later, save less now, and that saving now is for spending later, spend more of it now. Now, here's how we say that, we, just consumers, we say this, hey, interest rates went down, I can afford to buy a new car. Hey, interest rates went down, I can afford to buy a refrigerator. I can make those payments on that. And that's the sort of common sense way of looking at it. But what I'm saying to you is this, is that in this analysis of it, we see a person with some income, and they decide, how do I want to use this? Do I want to spend it today? Do I want to spend it later? And the interest rate is what influences that choice. And when that interest rate changes, it influences that choice. Interest rate's down, I'll spend more of it now and less of it later. Okay, so let me go back, and I'll do a little bit more over here in a second. Increase in spending by businesses And here we've got, it's a decrease in saving, but an increase in spending by households. And guess what? Those two things together stimulate the economy. So we had this monetary policy that is more expansionary, right? That's what got this all started an expansionary monetary policy, and we see that showing up as, hey, consumption spending's up. Hey, investment spending's up. Investment spending by businesses for capital goods. Investment spending's up. And you know, if you remember back to your uh, um, first economics class, GDP equals consumption plus investment plus government purchases plus net exports. Well, what I'm saying to you is, these two sectors, the household sector, the business sector, each one of them spending more for gross domestic product, for those newly produced final goods and services. Households spending more, saving less. Businesses spending more. So what that does is it stimulates the economy. Another thing that happens over here is there are fewer capital inflows now that interest rates are lower. Foreigners don't find this such a great place to lend money. Okay. Questions about this? Oh, I was putting numbers on these before. Here's number four, and number five, and number six. Four and five, increased investment spending. Number five, in increase in consumption spending. Number six, reduced capital inflows. Now the final event that we want to talk about, increase in expected inflation. If we see inflation coming, and I don't want to erase this because I will erase it in just a moment, but I want to relate these two ideas together. Think about this, if you see inflation coming, how that affects you. If you're, th and some people, like I own a home, and I'm not thinking about selling my home, I'm not thinking about buying a new home, and so I'm not talking about me in this example. Some people, though, are just kind of at that point where, let's say that what happens is you get a promotion at work, and let's say you have a new baby, and so you're a few months down the road, and you say, you know my savings account's kind of building up, things are going pretty good for me business-wise, career-wise, and I got a little bit bigger family than I used to have. And so, it doesn't have to be today, but I'm kind of thinking about getting a, a little nicer home. I've got a house now that's, I don't know, 1,000 square feet, and my house payments are $500 a month, and I'm thinking about maybe getting a house that's 1,500 square feet with house payments of $800 a month. 
I'm thinking I could afford this. I'm thinking also that I kind of need it. Some people are in that position where they're just kind of on the fence. Do I buy a new house now or do I buy a new house later? Other people aren't on the fence, and that's why I started off with me. I'm not on the fence. I'm not thinking about buying a different house. And so I'm not talking about me. But those people are kind of on the fence trying to decide. Then we say to them something like this, hey, I have some new information for you. And they say, really? What is it? And we say, due to or all the best forecasters tell us this, there's going to be 10% inflation this year. Over the next 12 months, prices are rising by 10%. Now, this person who was kind of on the fence and couldn't quite decide, mm, should I buy a new house now or wait? That person starts getting off that fence because here's what they're thinking. Hey, that house was going to cost, let's make up a, a number, $100,000. That house I was looking at was going to cost $100,000. And I could go buy that for $100,000 now. But if there's going to be 10% inflation, that house that's $100,000 today, next year it's going to cost $110,000. And I couldn't quite decide a moment ago, but here's what I just decided. If that, price of, if that house goes up $10,000 over the next 12 months, it's going to go up $833 a month, the price of that house is. And so if I wait one more year, and I can wait, physically I can wait, but if I wait one more year, would that be a smart financial decision to wait for that house to go up $833 a month, and now next year I go out in the market, hey, $833 a month, that's all my house payment would be. If I wait, uh, you know, like if, for me to buy this house, my house payments would be $800 a month. If I wait, the cost of that house goes up $833 a month. You know, I've waited as long as I should. I think I'm going to go buy a house. So when you are a consumer and you anticipate, I'm not talking about the actual inflation that's already occurred. When you anticipate inflation in your immediate future, that's when we start saying, I'm going to buy stuff. And I'm not buying stuff to be reckless or stupid. I am buying today before the price goes up. It's not what I'm talking about, but it's the same effect if somebody tells you, hey, over at this gas station across the street, they're going to increase the price of gas 50 cents tomorrow. Would you wait till tomorrow to buy gas or buy today? Buy today. Well, if we have inflation, prices throughout the economy are going to go up. And so houses are going to become more expensive. Cars are. If there's a $20,000 car and it goes up in price $2,000, then you start going, wow, maybe I ought to buy it before the price goes up $2,000. Not if you don't need a car. If you've got a brand new car and you're happy with your car or you're just not even thinking about a car, maybe you like to walk, then who cares? Car prices going up, they go down, that doesn't affect you. But if you are a person who's kind of on the fence, eh, I kind of could use a different car. I'm kind of thinking about it. If I could get the right deal, and then somebody goes, hey, that $20,000 car next year will be $22,000, then you might go, okay, that made my mind up. These tend to be big ticket items that are durable goods. Here's what we don't do. We don't go, oh, the price of stuff's going up 10%. I'm going to eat breakfast a hundred times to get breakfast at a cheaper price, today's price, rather than the higher price. No. Those are like inexpensive, non-durable goods, sort of daily consumables. The stuff that we buy when we anticipate inf inflation would be the big ticket, the durable goods items. A refrigerator, washer and dryer, car, motorcycle, a house, these kinds of things. So, what's the point of all that? If we anticipate inflation, that will show up right here where we say, I'm not going to save as much. I'm going to go out and buy a car rather than save everything. I'm going to go buy a house rather than save. I'm going to buy a washer and a dryer, a TV set. I'm going to buy these things rather than save. Or, or, and also, let's go back to this group. How does inflation affect you if you're in business? You're a business manager. And maybe what you're doing is you're manufacturing something, let's say refrigerators. And you're ma manufacturing refrigerators, and maybe in your factory you turn out, I don't know, a thousand refrigerators a week. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, guess what? There's going to be 10% inflation over the next year. Everything today, just everything, because we don't want to like focus on certain items, everything there is going to be 10% more expensive one year from today than it is today. Then here's what you might be thinking. 
hey, I've been selling my refrigerators, let's say wholesale, I've been selling them for $500 a piece. If everything goes up 10%, then next year those refrigerators won't sell for $500 a piece, $550. There is a potential for some profit there. Refrigerators, I'm going to be selling refrigerators a year from now for more money. Hey, I'm manufacturing 1,000 refrigerators a week. It'd be nice if I had a little bit bigger factory, and I can manufacture 1,200 refrigerators a week. At the higher price, I'd like to sell more refrigerators. And here's the good news. If I add on my factory today, start a construction project, I'll go out and get a contractor, and I'll say, hey, how much to build this? And they may say something like, a uh, quarter of a million dollars will add on to your factory. If I wait a year to do that, they're going to say not a quarter of a million dollars, but an extra 10%. It'd be an extra $25,000. So I'll tell you what I could do. I'll get me a contractor. We'll add on to my factory here. I'll increase my productive capacity. I'll do it today. I'll lock in the cost of this construction project and the machinery and equipment that goes in it. And then, a year from now, I'll just be paying off this building at its lower cost, and I'll be selling refrigerators for 10% more. So, what I'm saying to you is, when they anticipate inflation, these people, these business managers, they start saying, I want to invest in plant and equipment. I want to get more of that capital goods. I want to grow my business, because the stuff I'm selling is going to be sold for more, and I can grow my business today at what it costs me today to get this plant and equipment and these structures and so forth constructed. And so this group is affected by that anticipated inflation. Now, I'm going to redraw, but I want you to see something else, because this whole discussion of anticipated inflation doesn't occur in a vacuum. We don't just go walking along and all of a sudden go, oh, I think prices are going up 10%. It doesn't happen like that. There's something that happens first. And the something that happens first is what we already talked about, this thing right here. We already talked about monetary policy back just during the first week or so of the semester. We talked about monetary policy, and I told you then, Federal Reserve increases the money supply. It creates excess money balances. That leads to more spending. Here it is, more spending by households, more spending by businesses. So we've got expansionary monetary policy, excess money balances, more spending. That puts upward pressure on prices. And so this thing that we have already gone through and talked about, it has consequences down the road. It starts making people think, Gosh, I think there's going to be inflation. And so this whole discussion that we're getting ready to go into is an outcome or a consequence of this thing right here. And we already, and so I guess what I'm telling you is this, is that we have discussed the short-term impact of this monetary policy. The short-term impact is it stimulates the economy. Households spend more, businesses spend more, interest rates are down. But the longer term impact, and I told you it takes a year to two years for the inflation to show up, but a year or two after this happens, then people start talking about inflation. Hey, there's inflationary forces building up. There's going to be inflation. And so this next application of our model follows from the previous one. The previous one is expansionary monetary policy. And so our next application of anticipated inflation is coming toward us. It's what happens a year or two later. So anyway, let me come back then and erase and use our model, and we'll just kind of trace through these effects. Trace through the effects of the expansionary monetary policy. Uh, I'm sorry. Trace through the effects of the anticipated inflation. Okay, so here's our basic model, and now we'll snap our fingers, put it in everybody's head. Inflation's coming, 10% inflation. How do people react? I've already talked about this. There's two groups. Okay, the household sector, some people, some percent of the population sitting around, as I say, on the fence, can't quite decide should I buy a new house, new car, new washer, new dryer, new TV set, these big ticket items. 
And those people who are on the fence, now they're getting pushed off the fence by this anticipated inflation. I think inflation's coming. I think I better beat those price increases by buying a day before the price goes up. So when they do that, here's what they say. Increase my spending. Well, I can't afford to save then. I've got this $100 income or $1,000 or $10,000. I got this income. And if I spend more to buy the TV, the washer, the dryer, I save less. So there's a reduction in saving. And I'll put a one here. This is what's getting our process started. The household savings been reduced. A second thing, we anticipate inflation. Business managers say, gosh, I'll be able to sell stuff for more money down the road. I can add on to my plant and equipment and machinery and tools and so forth at a lower cost today before their prices go up. I think I'll do that. And so here we go. The business demand for credit goes up. I'll put a that's kind of a one here. I'll put a one there too because these are both happening. The business sector spending more, the household sector spending more. And so guess what? The household sector spends more, saves less. The supply of credit shifts to here to the left. The business sector is borrowing more to invest in plant and equipment the demand for credit shifts to the right. Pardon? Double whammy. I think that's what they call it at the Federal Reserve, the old double whammy. These are both pushing in the same direction, not both of them to the right, both of them to the left. The supply curve shifted to the left, the demand curve to the right. They're both going in the same direction. They're both saying higher interest rates. Smaller supply of credit, higher interest rate. Greater demand for credit, higher interest rate. Interest rates are up. I'll put a three here. Now, I've got a couple more things to say about it. Here's one of them. We haven't had any inflation on our story until now. And so I've never had to introduce the terms until now. I did before, but here's what we have at this point. We can talk about it. This is the real interest rate, our beginning interest rate. There wasn't inflation in the picture then. This is our nominal interest rate. And so that inflation, you know, we talked about that Fisher equation. Remember that? Where we've got the nominal interest rate is equal to the real interest rate plus the expected inflation rate. Remember the Fisher equation? Well, here we have all of our ingredients. And the way the Fisher equation was told to you, it's mathematics. It's just nominal rate equals real rate plus expected inflation. That's math. And you can say 5 equals 2 plus 3. 7 equals 3 plus 4. That's math. But it's, it doesn't tell us the why. Here's the why. The interest rate after inflation enters the scene is higher than it was to begin with when there was no inflation because we've got some people spending more and borrowing more business sector and we've got some people spending more and saving less and providing fewer funds in credit markets and the supply of credits down. And so anticipated inflation accelerates spending. It's accelerated spending by two groups but this group that's spending more is saving less. Okay, so anyway, we've got a reduced supply of credit, we increase in demand for credit, and now the nominal interest rate, the new market interest rate, is higher than it was when there was no inflation on the scene, and then the difference between those is expected inflation. Now, I'm going to draw you another picture here in a second. This takes time to develop. We had that monetary policy that was stimulating the economy. And monetary, a stimulative monetary policy doesn't create inflation that day. The Federal Reserve today could increase the money supply 20%, and we wouldn't just go, holy mackerel, now interest rates went up today because there's inflation. No, it takes time. 
So the Federal Reserve stimulates some money supply today, and people go out and they start spending more, and over time what happens is uh, excess capacity in the economy gets used up, and companies are selling all their product, and they're placing orders for you know, manufactured goods, and over time what happens is they start raising prices, but it takes time. So let's move over here and draw a different graph. It's more of a chart than a graph, but anyway, interest rate. What I'm saying is this, is, and here's today. We're going along here and the interest rates are just kind of stable in the marketplace. And then we get to a point where there is, let's say, an expansionary monetary policy. And that was that chart that we had, or that graph that we had, the previous application where the money supply expands more rapidly. Okay? And if you go back to that application, what happened was money supply expands more rapidly and interest rates go down. Okay. And there they are. But then what happens is, after a while, how long does this take? And by the way, maybe interest rates go down for one to three months, and then they just level off here for a while. The timing isn't the important thing because it depends on circumstances, how long it takes for rates to go down and so forth. But it doesn't take very long for these rates to go down in the marketplace. And then they just kind of level off for a while, and then after, I don't know, another six months, nine months, whatever, then what happens is that's when the, the economy is gathering steam and that's when people start to anticipate inflation. And when they start anticipating inflation, that's people go out and start buying stuff and not saving so much. Businesses go out and start borrowing more to expand, expand their plant and equipment. And so those forces are putting upward pressure on interest rates and so interest rates start going up. And then we reach some new equilibrium. And at this point, this new equilibrium down the road, like I say, this might be 12 to 24 months after that original policy change. That is, monetary policy became expansionary. It doesn't happen overnight, but in a year to two years, what happens is we find ourselves at some new higher equilibrium interest rate level. And that's this interest rate level that we're talking about in this chart. If you go back and look, interest rates went down a little bit when we got this expansionary monetary policy. So they went down and then they went up. When the, uh, inflation rears its ugly head, interest rates go up. And guess what? They're higher than they ever were to begin with. So maybe interest rates, to put some numbers on it, maybe they were 2% to begin with. They went down to 1.5% or maybe 1%, and now they might be at 5%. Interest rates down and then up. Now, this is not beyond your ability to understand, but you understand it because somebody's showing you, and I understand it because somebody showed me, and then the evidence was there. But if somebody just asks you, and if we just go out on the street and just ask a person, a passerby, or if we get some newspaper reporter, or we get some TV reporter, and say to them, hey, suppose the Federal Reserve wants to bring interest rates down, what should they do? Just this average person is going to go, well, that's easy. Expand the money supply. Increase the amount of money and credit in the economy. That will bring interest rates down. And that answer is exactly right if you have a short time perspective, one, two, three months. Because expansionary monetary policy brings interest rates down, but it only brings them down for a short while. And then what happens is it stimulates the economy, economic activity is picking up, we start getting inflation, and then interest rates go up, and they are higher than they ever were to begin with. This happened in the 1970s. The United States in 1966, I should say it happened in the mid-60s, and it went on for a generation. But in 1966, the Federal Reserve is getting pressure from the president. Who was the president then? Anybody? President in 1966? No, it, you know? Lyndon Johnson. 
Lyndon Johnson says to the Federal Reserve, you need to help me out here. That's what Johnson said to the Federal Reserve, you need to help me out here. Fighting a war on poverty, fighting a war in Vietnam, costs a lot of money. Low interest rates, that'd be great. So, the Federal Reserve resisted a little bit, and then Lyndon Johnson said, who was elected by 77 million people or whatever the number was. I was, you do what I say. There was like a big hassle and so forth. And at the end, the Federal Reserve said, no, we're not going to do it. And then they did it. We're independent. We don't have to. And then they did it. And so what they did is they started supplying more money and credit to the economy. Are we still on the gold standard? Were we on the gold standard? Well, it just depends on what you mean by gold standard. This gold standard has kind of been a farce since the 1930s, you know, in terms of whether we were on it or not on it or pretending right. to be on it or, right. you know, whatever. I think we, were to be on we were pretending to be on it. In 1930s, we told Americans, you can no longer own gold. If you own gold, go to jail. Right. That's in 1930s. But what we said is that, of course, foreigners, we're not going to send you to jail. If you've got dollars and you want to cash them in for gold, we'll do that. That was in, uh, and then that went up until officially 1971. And then in 1971, August 15th, I think it was on a Sunday, no, we're not going to do that anymore. But there were many, many years going by where we were, you know, pretending to uh, redeem those dollars into gold. But we were saying things like this, oh, you've got a bunch of dollars, you want to redeem it for gold? Do you, or do you want to be our friends? And then you go, oh, yeah, of course we want to be your friends. We'll keep these dollars. So anyway. Now, why did you ask me that question? Just as a distraction? Oh, no, no, not as a distraction. Uh, because I'm easily distracted. Well, I was, uh, my concern is, is how do you hedge against the inflation? How do you hedge against the inflation? You have to protect your interest rate. Yeah, I know what you're trying to protect. Yeah. No, but I mean, there's a lot of assets that people purchase. Some assets do really well during inflationary periods to hedge against inflation, and gold would be one. But there are other assets that people hedge against, you know, like real estate would be another one, and not so much houses, but possibly houses, but land, uh, silver. Maybe what you do is buy mutual funds, stocks, in other countries where they don't have the inflation. I mean, some people buy jewelry, or not jewelry already, but diamonds, stones, put them in a safe deposit box. There are different answers. So, in the mid-1960s, it started in 1966, and it lasted, I think it was late 65 that Johnson started pressuring the Federal Reserve, and it lasted for a generation. And so, what was happening, we hadn't been down this road before. We didn't know. You know, like in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression, right? And so it's not like they were out there creating inflation during that period. 40s were dominated by a war. 50s, very little inflation. So we've got a generation of policymakers that don't know anything about inflation. Not really. They heard of it. But then in 1965, we've got the war on poverty, war on Vietnam. The president says to the Federal Reserve, help me out. Federal Reserve says, okay. And they start putting more money in the economy. Expansionary monetary policy, interest rates down. But then what happens is it was followed after a year or so by inflation and interest rates would go up. And you know what the response was at this point? We just didn't try hard enough. And so then they say, okay, this time we are going to do it and we mean it and this is going to work. And so then what they do is they put more money in the economy, more expansionary monetary policy and interest rates would go down. And then after a while, they'd go up. And then say, I mean it this time. No, okay, and down and then up. Bear down. Down and then, you know, I can only reach so high. 1981, uh, Ronald Reagan took office in January. And I don't know all the numbers, but I think the prime rate was, I'm going to put a question mark up here, but I'm going to say like 21%, someplace around there. Treasury bill, treasury bill, I don't know, 15 to 16%. I don't know the exact numbers. I know the neighborhood. There are bonds still in circulation. 
30-year treasury bonds, treasury bond, that were yielding about 14%. I'll put a question mark out there. I don't know the exact number. It could have been 14.5%. How could that happen? And the answer is this confused thinking of an expansionary monetary policy will bring interest rates down. It will for a while. I mean, if that's all, for a while, yes. But will it permanently? No. Suppose you want lower interest rates, and not just for a while, but for quite a while. How do you do that? The opposite. This is an episode of the Seinfeld show, right? The opposite. If interest rates are here, and you want them to go down to here, then you do the opposite, which is a contractionary monetary policy. Here's what happens. If interest rates are here and you have a contractionary monetary policy, interest rates go up. Ooh, interest rates are higher. That's the opposite of what we wanted. No, it's not. Just a second. But now, interest rates are higher. Monetary policy is contractionary. People spend less. Businesses borrow less. And what happens is there's an increase. It's the opposite of this. Increase supply of credit. Households are saving more. Reduction in demand for credit. Businesses are borrowing less. And those higher interest rates come down lower than they ever were before because we have less inflation in the economy now. And so what we find out is during those periods when monetary policy is not inflationary, not expansionary, but sort of a steady monetary policy and we don't have inflation in the economy, that's when interest rates tend to be low. And I mean for long periods of time, not for a few months. We can make interest rates go as low as we want for a short time by just putting huge amounts of money in the economy. Federal Reserve can't. And interest rates will go down. But they just won't stay there forever because eventually all that money in the economy pushes inflation up and it goes up. And you know what you can do is you can look at these cases where there are countries that have horrible inflation rates. If you have a country with, let's say, the inflation rate is 500%, then what you're going to have is an interest rate of like 510%. The inflation rate plus real interest. And so if you want interest rates low, you've got to get rid of inflation. I mean low and keep them low. Get rid of inflation. And I'm not saying what's good and what's bad. All I'm saying is this was a confusion that took a generation, not only for the Federal Reserve. It didn't take the Federal Reserve a generation. But the Federal Reserve has these politicians harassing them, and newspaper editorialists, and people on TV. And the Federal Reserve is bombarded by these messages. And so the people at the Federal Reserve are learning, but it takes everybody else to learn the lesson that, boy, we just can't push interest rates down and keep them down with an expansionary monetary policy. Now, let's just say monetary policy is slow and steady. And it's always that way. And so we go back to this original interest rate. How would we make them go down from there and stay down? And essentially, it would come down to, essentially, this group of people right here is, do they want to save? That is to say, this is not the, uh, if interest rate, if monetary policy is not playing a big role, then mainly what's going on is we've got the business sector borrowing and the household sector saving, and that determines the fundamental forces, not the monetary forces, but the fundamental forces at work in the American economy. And so if you want those rates to go down, the main way they would go down would be if these people just start saving a lot. And just say, you know, we're not going to save 3% or 5% of our income, we're going to save 10%, 12%. And if Americans did that, interest rates would be lower. Japan, in their economy, they tend to save more. And interest rates are lower in the Japanese economy. Uh, in China now, not so much if you go back a generation, but China today, uh, the economy is growing, people's incomes are up. And so not only are our incomes up, but the Chinese economy doesn't have all the consumer goods available to it that we do. And so the Chinese have a higher savings rate. And since they have a higher savings rate, then they have lower interest rates there. But fundamentally, it will be more saving. And is that good or bad? I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying if we want to have lower real interest rates and keep them low, then import a bunch of Americans who want to save a lot of money, you know, a high percent of their income. Now, we don't do that, so anyway, it's unlikely to happen that way. 
Okay. Uh, if we take inflation out of the picture, and I mean just go along for years and years, and then people aren't thinking about inflation or whatever, we're mainly going to see a real interest rate on treasury securities and so forth. Uh, 2%. And so when we see interest rates, if you see interest rates are 8% on treasury securities, I don't mean because there, there are risky, risky loans out there that ought to have interest rates of 8% or 10 or 12. But if you find that the interest rate on a treasury security is not paying 2% but is paying 8, that's because there is 6% inflation. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? So anyway, uh, this took years for everybody to figure it out, and right now it is pretty well figured out. And uh, so what we were doing then is chasing our tail, though. It's like we're causing more and more inflation. You know, when these Treasury bond interest rates have to go up 14, 15, 16 percent, well, we were having about like 12 percent, 13 percent inflation. So 12 or 13 percent inflation plus 2 percent real interest rate equals 14, 15, 16 percent. Well, you can buy a 30-year treasury bond. 30 years old. That's the longest treasury bond. So there are people that probably still have those. If you had one, would, what would you do with it? Who would Well, maybe you would, because I'm going to put my arms out and do this kind of thing. Here's what happens is you buy one of those bonds, you pay 1000 bucks. It's paying 14% interest. And then inflation goes away, and interest rates start going down. And as interest rates go down, the price of that bond goes up, 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 up. And somebody comes along and goes, hey, will you sell me that for $1,800? And you go, okay. And then interest rates go down some more. It goes up to $2,200. And you go, oh, I should have held on. Anyway, um, it was just an incredible period. And the Federal Reserve was, I mean, uh, buckling down, really trying to push those interest rates down. And they just kept going higher. And the newspaper, the editorialists and stuff like this said, you're not working hard enough at it. You don't really have the idea in mind I had. Yes, we did. We did what you wanted. It just doesn't work the way you think. There's a short run, there's a long run. And the long run is the opposite. OK, so anyway, what we do nowadays is this. If we've got uh, the Federal Reserve says, hey, we need an expansionary policy. Here's what, the way we tend to do it now. The economy's not doing so well. We want to expand the money supply. We want to get the economy moving. We'll do that, but not hold it too long. We'll try and get the economy moving and pull back real fast before we ignite these inflationary fires and push interest rates way up. So we'll give it six months of expansionary monetary policy and then pull back. We won't give it four years of it, you know, because then we're just going to get a lot of inflation and high interest rates. This was the period when the United States had the highest interest rates in how many years? I don't know. Maybe ever in terms of just high throughout the economy, treasury bonds, everything else. Uh, I can't think of any time in U.S. history when they were higher. Okay, what are we going to do next? Well, I'm glad you asked. We've been talking about the interest rate as though there's just one. You know, it's whatever's in the middle graph here, supply and demand, the interest rate. Okay, I'll put a little picture up here just to remind you. Supply and demand for credit, loanable funds model, the interest rate. What this really is, is sort of an interest rate climate or an interest rate environment that we've been describing. Now, what happens is this. Each loan that comes along is different than others. And I don't mean to say every single one's different, but I mean car loans are different than home loans. Right? Credit card loans are different than car loans. Some car loans are a three-year car loan. Some car loans are four-year car loans. Some five, some six. 
Some homeowns are 15 years, some are 30, some homeowns are 20 years. So each loan, each specific loan has its own characteristics. And so if we want to understand the interest rate on a specific loan, we start off with this interest rate environment that we've just talked about, but then we need to come back and add in the effects of other things such as risk or term. And I'll just write down a couple of these, risk or term. Long-term loans, different than short-term loans. Risky loans, different than safe loans. So we would come back and find out about the spe specific loan. Not only what's the interest rate environment, but then what about this particular loan we're talking about? And then that's how that loan is priced. And so what we're going to do now is talk about a couple of things, next time I should say, that are characteristics of specific loans and how those affect the overall interest rates on particular loans. See you next time. So long.